how is it that, uh, that this happens today? Is it that, as some might think, that uh, God takes individuals, that he brings a terrible thing like this on John or others? Well, let's look at a, another scripture to show what God's position is in this. Because as we talked about, if Adam was responsible and he was being influenced by Satan, it really helps us see that God didn't purpose that uh, anyone go through these horrible things. And in fact, James, the first chapter, verse 13 says, When under trial, let no one say, I'm being tried by God. For with evil things, God cannot be tried, nor does he himself try anyone. So did God take John? Did he need a plumber in heaven? No. And that sounds a little strange, because we know that in heaven, there are spirit creatures. God, angels, Jesus, they are strong spirit creatures that are invisible. So no, God didn't take John because he needed another person in heaven. But rather, the sin and death that we all inherited had effect on John, and it's, we all feel bad that it was so premature. But now what about, get back to that original question. Are we going to see John again? What about seeing any of our dead loved ones? Well, turn to Acts chapter 4, if you have a Bible. Here is the provision made to make that possible. Acts 4 and verse 12. It says, furthermore, there is no salvation in anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must get saved. Well, what name? What person? Well, verse 10 was talking about Jesus. So through Jesus, it says, men would get saved. Well, what does that mean, get saved? Well, let's go to another scripture, John 11. And if you want to stay in John 11, we're going to be getting back to it. Because it's such a, a wonderful account of where Jesus resurrects one of his dear friends. But notice, as Jesus is talking to Martha, his friend, and this, uh, this individual's brother, who Jesus resurrected, he makes this statement, John 11, and we're going to look at uh, verse 25. And I'm getting there. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who exercises faith in me, even though he dies, will come to life. So yes, Jesus not only was the source of helping mankind, but he described himself as the one who would carry out this resurrection, bringing ones back to life. And when we think about uh, Jesus' friend Lazarus, he had died four days earlier. And in this account, uh, we read that, yes, he was actually dead. But we learn many things in this account that answers our questions that we brought up. First of all, just notice in verse 5 that Jesus loved Martha, uh, her sister Mary, and Lazarus. So they were close friends. He really loved them. But in verse 11, death is compared to something. It says, after he said these things, he added, Lazarus, our friend, has fallen asleep, but I am traveling there to awaken him. Now, why was a comparison to sleep made to death by Jesus? Uh, it's interesting, there's two main reasons. One, Jesus was going there to awaken him. He was going to bring him out of death. So Jesus had the power to do that, as if waking somebody up. But secondly, Jesus compared death to sleep because that individual was not aware of anything going on. After Jesus talked to Lazarus and the whole rest of chapter 11 of John, Lazarus never said a thing about what he was doing during that time he was dead. He wasn't traveling somewhere. He wasn't in heaven. He wasn't in, in hell. He was asleep. He was unconscious. And you know that type of sleep you get when you're put out for some operation? I don't know if every, any of you, and I hate to even say this word, but have, have had a colonoscopy. <laughs> um, but you don't really know when you're going in and when you're coming out. In fact, last time I had one, I thought the procedure was coming up, 
And the nurse says, would you like a muffin or a cup of coffee? And I was like, no, I can't have that before I go in for surgery. So, but the point is, you're in such a dense sleep, you don't know what's going on. So it makes sense that Jesus compared death to that. Time will go by, there's no pain, there's no suffering, and he was there to resurrect his friend. He even had to convince his apostles that he was talking about death. But we appreciate that now Jesus compared death to sleep, but we still ask the question, okay, what about uh, the condition of the dead? We have other scriptures that help us to see that, and we're gonna keep John 11 open, but uh, this time I'm gonna read you two scriptures, and one King James, and that's what a lot of Protestant religions use, just to show you that you can get the same idea from different Bibles. Now I'll read another one from the Catholic Bible. But from the King James, notice this scripture in the 146th Psalm, and verse four. And see if it doesn't describe a condition of somebody being dead as being unconscious, not feeling anything. Because verse four says, his breath goes forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. So, much like he was told to, to Adam, he would return back to the dust, and he'd be gone. And let me read another one from the Catholic Bible. This is a modern Catholic translation, but this is Ecclesiastes chapter nine, and we're gonna read two verses, five and 10. Okay, verse 5 says, For the living at least know they will die, but the dead know nothing. They don't even have their memories. And then verse 10, Whatever you do, do well, for in death where you are going, there is no working or planning or knowing or understanding. So we get the same thought from all these Bibles that when we're dead or unconscious, we're waiting for God to bring us back to life. But now how could John and Martha, who we're reading about, have uh, such confidence in Jesus? Well, notice the conversation they had between them uh, in verses 21 to 25. And just try to feel the confidence Martha had, that Jesus had the power to bring her dead brother back. Verse 21, Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask God for, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he'll rise in the resurrection on the last day. And then that verse we read previously, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who exercises faith in me, even though he dies, will come to life. Well, how did Martha have such confidence in the resurrection? Well, Jesus had performed resurrections when he was on the earth before. He resurrected others. Martha knew about that. John knew about all these different times that Jesus resurrected once. He was familiar with many accounts of resurrections that it could take place. And something interesting, when you look at the statement there in verse four, Martha was not expecting her brother to be resurrected very soon. She didn't think he went up to heaven and uh, was already resurrected. Because notice he, she said there at the end of 24, you, um, it says, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. So she looked forward to a future time when God would bring him back to life. And she knew that she'd have to wait a while. Well, why? See, and this brings up a common thought that is said about people who die, that all good people go to heaven. Now, she didn't think her brother was in heaven. Why? Well, simply put, she knew that Jesus had to provide his life for mankind to get out of the grave. We know he was a sacrifice. He hadn't sacrificed his life yet. He was still there. He had to give his life so that man could be resurrected. So he knew that once that provision was made, 
And then, once Jesus was given power in his kingdom to resurrect the dead, that resurrection would take place. So, it makes sense, these, these points, as we read about this discussion between um, Martha and Jesus. Now, let's, let's see a little bit more, and I shouldn't have closed my Bible. Back in John 11, we want to see what feeling Jesus had for these friends of his. Here he was there to resurrect Lazarus, but still, notice what he felt. Verses 33 to 35. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he groaned within himself and became troubled. He said, where have you laid him? He said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus gave way to tears. At that, the Jews began to say, see what affection he had for him. So see, Jesus had such love for people, he felt bad that they were grieving. He was gonna resurrect Lazarus, but still he felt very bad for what they were going through. Now, if Jesus felt that way then, he was gonna resurrect his friend a few instances later, how much more so he feels bad for people today who are going through horrible conditions. Yes, Jesus has that kind of love. But let's see how things went as we go on in verses 30 and 39, and then 43 through 44. Then Jesus, after groaning again within himself, came to the tomb. It was in fact a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by now he must smell, for he has been dead for 40 days. And then drop down to 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had been dead came out with his feet and hands bound with wrappings, and his face was uh, wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, free him and let him go. What an amazing thing took place. Jesus showed he had the power of the resurrection to bring his friend back. And when we think about bringing him back, uh, Jesus gave his friend not only life, but he gave him an opportunity to join Jesus' followers, some of these early followers who would rule with Jesus in heaven. Jesus talked about a little flock who would be with him in his heavenly kingdom. So he gave Lazarus a, a chance to maybe be part of that group. But now, what, what would that resurrection that we're thinking about John and we're thinking about others before Jesus gave his life for mankind, before they got this group, he got this group together to rule with him, where else would ones be resurrected? Well, I want to point you to uh, something that most people know, and that's the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father Prayer. I'm going to take a drink of water somewhere. And, uh, if you want to just look at Matthew chapter 6, a lot of people know that prayer, but again, think about the wording. Verse 9, you remember our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and at this point, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we get the point that God wants his will to also be done on earth. And we know that this earth is a mess. It's going to be cleaned up. Jehovah has his purpose of cleaning up the earth, both through the destruction of wicked and wickedness. And John really looked forward to that time. He could be a part of that cleanup crew. Can you imagine the kind of work that would be when God wants the earth brought back to his original purpose of a paradise. Another scripture that helps us to appreciate what the earth will be like when John comes back is mentioned here in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, I'm gonna read that from the King James as well. <clears throat> Sometimes people will say to us, well, why are you reading it from a King James? But we do want to show everybody that these thoughts are from many Bibles. They're not, they're not all different. We can get the same information from the King James and from other Bibles. 
So we've got Revelation 21 and verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> It says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his peoples, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, just taking this first verse, maybe remember the tabernacle the Israelites had, that was a tent, and it was used in worship of Jehovah, but it showed that Jehovah was present with the Israelites. So it wasn't that he was right there standing next to them, but he was protecting them and helping them. In fact, if you were invited into someone's tent back in ancient times, you were guaranteed uh, that you'd be taken care of. You'd have hospitality, you'd have safety, and so forth. So here it's saying God is going to provide this tent over mankind. What's the results? Verse four, and God shall wipe away all tears from uh, from their eyes, and there shall be no more, you know what? Let me get my glasses. <laughs> the uh, print in this King James is just small enough. No excuses, right? Uh, verse four, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor shall there be any more pain, for her former things have passed away. Now, look at those things that will be removed. Are those speaking about things in heaven? No, there was never death or sorrow or sickness in heaven. So again, it's referring to the earth and the blessings that would be provided on the earth. You know, an ancient individual who lived uh, many years ago by the name of Job looked forward to an earthly resurrection. And again, because he lived before Jesus provided the ransom sacrifice, he was looking forward to be resurrected to the earth, not to go to heaven. But let's read about uh, what Job said about the resurrection. And uh, uh, just to alert you too, our last song for our memorial, we're going to be uh, using a song that's based on Job, Job 14. And we do have some of that song uh, the wording printed out. And so our attendants are gonna hand some out if you need one. And if we don't have enough, we'll just print a few more or do the best we can. But now we're, we're going to Job 14 to see what Job looked forward to. And this, these are the same words that John knew. He was familiar with this scripture. Uh, verses 13 through 15. He said, Oh, that in the grave you would conceal me, that you would hide me until your anger passes by that you would set a time limit for me and remember me. If a man dies, can he live again? I will wait all the days of my compulsory service until my relief comes. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the work of your hands. The footnote in this Bible says another word for long and it would be yearn. So what's the point? God yearns for to bring back those of his friends. You know, we miss friends. We're gonna miss John. We're gonna look forward to the time when he's back. How much more so our creator misses those who are his friends. And here Job was saying that when you call, I look forward to coming out of the grave. And we really appreciate that this is what uh, John knew about as well. So our last point was, what guarantee do we have that these things will really happen? Well, one thing, God gives us his word. He writes it in the Bible. He puts his name on it. Jehovah provided his son, Jesus Christ. That is a stamp on that guarantee. Jesus was resurrected, that others could be resurrected. And Jesus provided miracles, showing that it was possible on a larger scale when he ruled in his heavenly kingdom. So why is it good that we came today? And we appreciate all of you coming. Your coming today has helped those who are grieving in this family and friends. Um, we're able to cry together, maybe laugh together over some memories that we had about John. We all need to do as John did 
Remember when you bought that card for Erica? You husbands, don't forget those times when you can express your love for your wife and for your, for your family. And another thing too is if you have spiritual goals, if you want to read the Bible more, if you want to do better spiritually, don't put it off. Now time is short. All of us need to show our love for our Creator, Jehovah God, and His Son. Now we want to just make a quick announcement. This is pretty much the end of our program today. Um, after we have a concluding song that we're going to sing, uh, we're going to have a brief prayer by Brother Annie Nelson. And then you're invited to stay for some refreshments and Sister Schleicher, Erica, really look forward to spending some time visiting with you then. She was really hoping that she could make it through this memorial service and then spend time with you and then she can let the tears flow. So, but uh, let's, if you'd like to, you can stand to sing this song and it's in a song book, it is song 111. You don't have to stand if you don't want to. And the title of the song is He Will Call and then we'll have for their ready Nelson give a, a brief prayer.
Father Jehovah. We petition you. We thank you, Father, that uh, we have the hopes for the future. Uh, the resurrection hope is so wonderful. Uh, we appreciate, Father, that uh, you love us, as Jim talked about. You care about us so much. You gave your only son so that uh, we could have life. So please help us to take advantage of um, the opportunity to learn about you and your ways, because this earth is going to change. We don't ever have to lose loved ones. So we, we thank you, Father, that uh, we could gather and be a support to the Schleichers and their extended family. Please uh, help us to do what we can to uh, be a strength to them. And uh, we'd be remiss without uh, thinking of that uh, uh, video that we had last year, Father, at our uh, regional convention where the young gal welcomed her sister back and, and tears of joy flowed. We uh, look forward to that with John. So we love you, Father. Thank you for allowing us to be here and, and read your word. Help, help us to be faithful, Father, because it will take faith. It will take us uh, strength uh, to do what you ask us to do, to be found in your favor so we can be in that new world so that uh, we can see our loved ones again. And many here, Father, have lost loved ones, just as the Schleicher family has. So be with us all as we uh, wait for those tombs to be opened. So we love you, Father, and we send this prayer, if it be pleasing, to your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Thank you.